I'm just going to say again, welcome to everybody who's here. Um, I'm Karen Houck from UC Berkeley, and we it's Solar Week this week, which is um, a week twice a year where solar scientists will answer um, young people's questions about the sun and about life as a scientist. And welcome to our Solar Week live webinar featuring Dr. Liz McDonald. She's going to talk about Aurora Citizen Science and the power of the crowd. And she'll talk for about 30 minutes and then answer your questions. Your microphone's muted and your, web your webcam is off. However, you can ask a question in the Q&A box throughout the webinar and we'll address it at the end. Um, Again, if you don't see the Q&A box, move your pointer around and it will pop up. Um, you can also ask questions of the solar scientists at www.solarweek.org through the end of the week. So that's today and tomorrow. Um, and that will be it until next October. Uh, I wanted to say that this webinar is being recorded. And let me introduce Dr. Liz McDonald. She's a space physicist who works at NASA. Liz has been studying the glitter of the Northern Lights for over 20 years, and it never ceases to amaze her. In addition to doing citizen science and outreach, Liz McDonald does some amazing high-tech space physics. In 2018, her project published a landmark new study documenting the origin of a newly recognized type of aurora called Steve. Welcome, Liz McDonald. Thank you. It's great to be here. Uh, are you seeing my slides? Yes. Okay. So what is this? Uh, yes, with, with the movie. Yes. Okay, great. Great, yes. I'm very excited to be here and to talk to you about Aurora and what I do. Um, this is a movie about Aurora that was all um, captured. It's all time-lapse photography by a really great photographer out of Alberta. And I just wanted to kind of stare at the glory of this for a minute and people can kind of think to themselves, what are my questions about the Northern Lights? And what am I seeing? Um, you know, just there's all sorts of scales here and structures and, uh, and it's really beautiful. So it means different things to different people. Um, and it's really a privilege to be able to study a phenomena like this that really connects to people and to connect it to physics. So I'm um, going to jump into that. Uh, before I do, though, I wanted to share this uh, little quote, tweet actually from an astronaut. Um, people have asked me what a burrito of awesomeness smothered in awesome sauce is, and it looks like the aurora. Um, so I really like this, uh, this kind of quote. It's, it's colorful. Um, but mo most people don't actually know what the aurora is, so I hope you will know more about the aurora than uh, an astronaut by the end of this talk. Um, okay, so here we are. Um, I have a project called Aurorasaurus. We have a little dinosaur, Rory, meet Rory. I'll tell you about that by the end, how you can participate in citizen science uh, with us and NASA and NSF. and um, uh, people around the world who are reporting that they have seen the aurora. All right, so this is sort of a big word blob about heliophysics and space weather and citizen science and um, just kind of curious, do people know what this means? If you don't know what this means, or if you do, that's good, because I'm going to try and define all of these terms. Um, the type of science that we do in solar and space physics is sort of a small niche area, and um, we have lots of uh, specialized words for that. So basically my talk is gonna go through my story and some out of, out of this world science that we can do, and how we can do that together. Um, before I got there, I wanted to say something about um, uh, encouraging everyone to really um, participate, to be interested, we, people around the world do extraordinary things and specialized things, um, and NASA really needs all kinds of voices at the table, and we have all kinds of really tough problems uh, that we need. We need everybody to show their cards and put their cards on the table and say, I'm here, 
I have questions. Um, really, science is about asking questions. It's not about having the answers. Um, uh, but we work towards those answers together. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, my background, and then we're going to get into like what is plasma physics and the aurora, space weather, this thing called Steve, all of that. Um, so just to briefly start with where I started, I just um, came from my hometown and I got to give a lot of talks in my hometown to audiences of middle school girls and other audiences and uh, with my, my parents. And so um, I actually shared that uh, my dad used to take me out in the natural world um, from a very young age, so much so that my very first word was duck because I was looking at ducks in the sky. And so he really inspired a love for that um, and was really much more on the biological side himself. Um, and my mom uh, was a teacher who loved math. So she wasn't so much for calculus and all the, you know, that kind of math, but she loves origami and knitting. And together, all of those interests combined really um, did give me a, a, a good background to be interested. Um, that said, you know, I had no idea what physics was when I went to college. Um, I took physics. I went to the, uh, I came from a very small town in eastern Washington. And um, I studied hard and I received actually a NASA space grant scholarship to go to the University of Washington. And as part of that scholarship, I got uh, a research um, position in the summer. And so I was very fortunate to be um, mentored by the woman who's in the slide here, Ruth Skoke. And uh, she introduced me really to what was physics, what was research. Um, I had taken some, I had taken my first year of physics and calculus and barely survived, so I wasn't that into it. Um, but she gradually uh, um, introduced me to the world of studying the aurora, which I thought was really cool, and how we do that with fundamentals of physics and engineering and actually apply that to something that we can see um, that's quite tangible and also quite important to our uh, society. So um, I think from that background, I've always felt that more people can do physics and should do physics than are necessarily encouraged um, or realize that they can. Uh, but you just have to keep going and, uh, and you can get there. Uh, so that was my undergrad. And then I was very fortunate to go to the University of New Hampshire for graduate school. So five more years of training. And there, I continued to study the Northern Lights. And my, my part of the project was to build a small sensor, work with the engineers to build a small sensor that um, flies on rockets that NASA flies above the Northern Lights to collect data on what causes them. And so the Northern Lights, as you'll hear about more later, are a process of charged particles from the space environment raining down on the upper atmosphere. And there's all kinds of variations of those particles. And so we have all kinds of instruments that actually measure what's called like the microphysics of what's going on. So I did get to go up to Alaska and see my first aurora up there and um, really get, um, get to uh, the most exciting part of our business is the launches. And so that's that was great. Um, and from there, I went on to Los Alamos National Lab, and I did a couple more years of training called postdoctoral training there. And then I became a staff member and then a team leader there. And I spent nine years there and worked on instruments, uh, not just rocket instruments. Rockets are like really good for training students, and they're much smaller, cheaper experiments. They only last 10 minutes or so, and you get a whole thesis work of worth of data. Um, but satellite experiments go on and on and cost a lot more. And I, I used the training that I received in graduate school to uh, study a similar type of instrument um, in a lab uh, and build these instruments at Los Alamos um, for both um, NASA uh, rockets, sorry, NASA satellites, the radiation belt storm probes, now called the Van Allen probes, as well as um, payloads that fly at geosynchronous orbit. 
Um, so we test these kinds of instruments. The instruments are shown in the upper right here. There's kind of an aperture and they measure the particles from space and we need to know their energy and what direction they're coming from and how intense they are. And so to do that, we can simulate that. We basically can simulate the vacuum of space in this big vacuum chamber that's shown in the bottom here, um, this big silver thing the bottom of the slide. And, uh, and so we can make a very controlled experiment to test your instrument, make sure it's fully working before you launch it. So we, we did, I worked on a lot of that in the lab there. Okay, so now I'm gonna move on to, um, to the science behind this, behind all of these things that we do. Um, and starting with what is plasma? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if anybody in the audience here maybe thinks about blood plasma. Um, that's actually fair to think about that. Um, in, and actually the, the physicists, the scientists in my field stole the name from the biological field. So they were just starting to have plasmas of charged particles in like neon glass tubes and that kind of thing. And they, they stole the name. But what I'm really talking about as plasma is the fourth state of matter. It's very rare, relatively rare on Earth, but ubiquitous in the universe. Um, actually, space is not empty. It's filled with plasma, um, which is separated, heated gas that's separated into its positive and negative very small components, so electrons, and then what we call ions, which are any kind of positively charged particle. It could be just a proton, could be an oxygen positively charged ion, um, that kind of thing. Um, so we uh, study the plasma state of matter. Um, plasmas respond to magnetic fields. Magnetic fields move particles around. Um, plasma physics is all about the electric and magnetic fields. Um, okay, so let me see. Um, some of the ways plasma is shown on Earth are lightning, um, you can have some plasma TV, you can have um, the discharge or the um, spark that you get when you get a, a carpet, um, static electricity off walking across a carpet, that means that you've um, made a tiny little plasma in air and um, broken down the, the molecules that are in the air that we breathe um, into, into this superheated gas. But it's much more common at much more higher altitudes. Okay. So moving on, that's like the basis that we need to know here to get into space weather. So space weather is all about the sun and that's where this process starts. But to get to the aurora, you have like many, many steps in between. The sun is huge and it's a long way away. It's 93 million miles away. So the sun gives us um, not just light, but these charged particles, these plasma particles, we can think about them as glitter. It's always coming out from the sun, but sometimes there's much more um, larger emissions. And sometimes that comes towards Earth and can interact with the Earth's magnetic field. So the sun has a magnetic field, the Earth has a magnetic field, shown by the purple lines in this cartoon kind of here. Um, we think about two magnets, they can either attract or repel. In our case, with the particles coming from the sun and the particles within the Earth's magnetic field, they can get, um, there can be attraction, that energy can couple into the Earth's uh, dipole, kind of butterfly-shaped magnetic field. That energy can swirl all around and ultimately end up on the dark side of the Earth, the far side of the Earth, where those particles get another little kick and they can rain down on the upper atmosphere. So I'm gonna go into that a little bit more in this next movie. This next movie um, says, put on your glitter glasses. So you're gonna be inside the magnetic field line looking at the 
glitter coming down. So I'm gonna put on my glasses. Okay, um, so now we're inside the field line. There's electrons uh, and they're bouncing. Um, they're raining down toward the upper atmosphere and they're going to hit the ambient um, parts, the very top of our atmosphere, which is not very dense at all. But that's where you get the light of the aurora. And um, what happens is that uh, the particles from space that rain down um, deposit their energy as they go. And so then depending on what altitude they get, they hit, you get different colors. And so there's both oxygen and nitrogen at these very high altitudes that we're talking about. And primarily, um, primarily the colors of the aurora are from uh, oxygen, both the main green color and the main red color that's dimmer but at higher altitude, those are both from uh, oxygen and different emissions of oxygen. So I have a couple more demos to show you that. I'm gonna put this slide up there and I'm gonna gesture behind me to my little Plinko board. And I'm not sure if people can see this, but just to further illustrate the way the particles rain down, you can imagine that they're hitting um, particles in the atmosphere, kind of like this sort of thing, just kind of collisional process. And then light happens where those collisions happen. So I have another little LED here that shows you maybe shows you a lot of different modes. One of them looks more like Aurora. Um, and then I have this 3D LED kind of thing that actually shows you better what the swirling colors of the Aurora look like. So hopefully people can see that because the Aurora and the atmosphere is really this big 3D structure. Um, you get the red color at the top and then a little bit of blue from a little bit of nitrogen and then some green and then even you can get a little bit of pink from nitrogen molecules at the bottom. Um, this is of course not exactly like the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere is less dense at the top of the atmosphere. This is like 600 miles up whereas the bottom of this sort of cube is like 60 miles up. And uh, right at the bottom, this last inch is where all of our weather and our, our plains and all of mountains, all the stuff that you think of as really tall occurs. Um, and then the aurora occurs uh, quite a bit higher up. But in reality, um, there's also kind of a gradient. So the stuff that's happening much higher is less, um, less bright. Okay, I can go back to that, but I'm gonna keep going. Why do we care about Aurora? So we care about Aurora because uh, a couple of reasons. Um, it's this, the sun can do really drastic things. The sun can go crazy. Um, and in the past, the largest type of Aurora, the furthest south the Aurora was ever seen. When the sun gets more active, which happens every 11 years, the aurora comes further south and this kind of oval region where aurora occurs um, broadens. And, and it means that you could see aurora possibly in Maryland where I live or at the largest event that we've ever studied uh, that we know about, a lot about, um, happened actually in 1859. It was called the Carrington event. And in that event, auroras were seen as far south as Bermuda and Mexico and Cuba, uh, so it was really a huge disturbance. Um, and at that time, the cutting edge technology was something called telegraphs, and telegraphs are really long wires. And aurora is uh, a bunch of electrons coming down, and even those, though those electrons don't reach the ground, that because of physics, they induce currents, they induce other electrons to move in those long wires. And so, um, so actually the telegraph systems, some of them burned up because there was so much current in the wires, and some of them also operated without it even being plugged into electricity or to any power source. So there was all kinds of havoc. Um, large storms have also caused uh, blackouts on the ground. They can affect our power systems, our power grid and transformers and all that kind of stuff. 
And uh, there was a very large, long nine hour blackout in 1989 in Quebec. And those kinds of things are really costly. So Aurora, it's happening out in space. It has effects on the ground. It affects our technologies. And if you think about today, everything that runs on, um, on technology, satellite technology, we're really very susceptible to Aurora. So we need to understand it better. However, space is so large, there's only a couple of satellites monitoring this whole system, and we don't have an understanding of um, predicting when the Aurora is going to get that large. And so our models, one of our models is shown on the right hand side here. Um, and some of our images of the global view of the Aurora is shown on the left hand side. They're both very low resolution. And so we need uh, better ways to assess where the Aurora is visible in real time. And that's one of the reasons why we're now doing citizen science where people can actually report in real time using their smartphones um, or other devices if they have seen the aurora to help us improve these models and understand this whole system to the point of predictability, uh, more like our normal weather that we're familiar with. Um, okay, so all of this is the field of space weather. Um, this is Jari who spoke to you some possibly some folks who were on uh, last year. Uh, she's one of the people in charge of space weather here at NASA Goddard. And I have another movie of space weather effects that um, I think I've kind of spoken to most of them here. So I'm going to skip that for the moment. Um, but just to go on to uh, further kind of motivate why we need um, why we thought citizen science for auroras. And this is sort of a crazy idea because we have satellites and we have models. Um, nobody thought, oh, let's use Twitter for auroras. But actually, um, in the last uh, 10, 15 years, since uh, the last solar maximum, solar minimum, uh, there was a, a solar maximum in 2003, 2004, there was one in 2014. In between there, Social media was invented, the iPhone was invented, the world has changed a lot and people's behavior have cha has changed with it. And so actually a lot of people want to see Aurora and a lot of people now have technology where they can uh, contribute. Okay, so that's led to this thing called Aurorasaurus where we can help people um, report and get alerts for seeing Aurora. And really all they need to tell us is where they are when they saw it. The photographs here are some of the wide variety of reports that we get um, in a month of Aurora. We also look at uh, tweets and um, there's kind of a simple form on the website aurorasource.org. We also have um, a blog. I have some links with some other um, links to actually uh, the demos that I showed you, ways that you could see Aurora using a simple pair of VR goggles, a Google Cardboard pair, um, that kind of thing. Uh, so we've been operating this website uh, called Aurorasaurus, which is combining a model and points of people reported citizen science data. Um, all that citizen science means is that people have volunteered to give uh, contributions and in our case it's a lot of people who are really good photographers and chase aurora particularly up in the northern states and across canada there are some great um, keen groups of people who were already taking amazing photographs and we we asked them to also submit their photographs for science and they were very willing to do so and so we've worked together on that um, their apps are in the app stores and we have a number of papers on this uh, and we have open data from people who all the reports that we've collected it's anonymized um, we have a whole database and system for collecting this data properly so that the data is protected um, okay so what did we find we actually um, having this network of people allowed us to not only notice that um, people were actually able to see uh, Aurora with their cameras and even by eye 
further from the poles than our models predicted. And so we updated our models. That was a really useful result. And then we also got into a discovery because the photographers uh, showed us a bunch of photos of something and we didn't know what it was. So that's the story of Steve. I'm gonna play you this little movie and uh, then we'll talk about Steve um, as the last part of the talk. Oops. People were out observing the aurora and they started noticing something that was overhead as well when they were seeing the aurora far to the northern regions. It was unlike most aurora. Talk to the scientists, we didn't know what it was. And together they said, we'll keep taking observations and we'll call it Steve in the meantime. Steve is mostly a very narrow purple arc and Sometimes it has these little green features that go along with it as well that are kind of like waving fingers or a picket fence. That means that there's plasma physics happening up there to cause that light and to make these little discrete features that we don't understand yet. We now have some satellite observations from the ESA satellite called SWARM that show uh, that Steve optically is associated with a very strong flow um, in the particles in the ionosphere, the upper level of our atmosphere. Steve is important for a number of reasons. Um, it's really exciting that uh, people armed with cameras all over the globe can capture something that we didn't fully understand and shed new light on that. It's also really exciting that this happens further to the south where there are more there are more people, so it might be a kind of aurora that more people can see than the usual kind. We're now able to look up at the sky and see things about the aurora and this sub-auroral region that we never understood before, and then we can correlate that with our traditional observations and lead to greater understanding. All right, so that's the short intro to Steve. I can talk a little bit more about it. We have uh, a paper that came out about a year ago in the Journal of Science Advances. It's open access, anyone can read it. Just look for new science in plain sight. And uh, what that showed was that um, photo, uh, people have been taking these photographs for a long time. Um, the discovery is actually that this is something that uh, was also known to scientists, but was never known to be visible. And so it's a new type of aurora. It's not the traditional aurora, which is this raining down of particles. It's this narrow east-west kind of structure in the sky. And it, it corresponds to something that we know called the subauroral ion drift, which is a really strong flow uh, from east to west. And the charged particles drag across the neutral particles. And, um, and somehow emit this very interesting purple color of light. And so we also now have an acronym for STEVE, Strong Thermal Emission Velocity Enhancement. And that uh, corresponds to what we see when we use our traditional sensors, measuring the electrons and the positive ions in the upper atmosphere, um, along with what we see from the ground. And so people from the ground actually can observe this continuously whereas a satellite only observes it once every 90 minutes for like two minutes at a time. So it's doing all of these, it's, it's evolving and it, it lasts for about an hour. Uh, we don't fully understand when and which types of storms have steep. So it's really an exciting open area of research. Um, and it's really been great to share this with people around the world. So um, there's a great podcast for kids called Wow in the World that did a wonderful, fun episode about Steve. I definitely encourage you to check it out because it's much more exciting than me talking about it. Uh, it's just really cute and fun. Um, there's people like Jordan Anderson in Calgary who have students who actually have a science fair project about something that is currently being researched. Um, so Steve has been really exciting. We've also seen other uh, students um, go back to school because they've discovered a love for taking photographs of the night sky, so much so that they want to study um, physics and astronomy. And that's actually 
Andy Wittemann, um, whose tweet is up here on this final slide. Uh, and then Aurora means so much to so many people, and it's been really great to connect uh, the science with that larger experience, and then with the awe that we all feel when we um, look at photographs of the beauty of the Aurora. So uh, that is my talk with much thanks to all of the citizen scientists and the other scientists on our team and those that we've collaborated with uh, to make this happen. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Um, I'm wondering if, are people able to type in the uh, question and answer box? I know I wasn't able to as a participant. So if you have questions, you could also put them in this in this chat box. And for, for both of those, uh, just move your cursor around on the screen and the, the Q&A box or the chat box should pop up. Do you have any questions that I have not answered or seen because I wasn't able to really read them while I was talking? You, you covered, so we had some kind of like basic questions, um, which you did cover, which is helpful. Okay. Um, and I also want to remind people that if you're not able to ask questions now or you're thinking about it, like don't forget that you can go on www.solarweek.org and you can ask questions there through to the rest of today and tomorrow. Uh, let's see, okay, here are some questions. Here is a question from David. Are there electrical effects on the ISS or the International Space Station? Yeah, that's a great question. So the orbit of the ISS does not reach into where the aurora is very often, um, but there can be some effects. Um, any satellite is made of metal conductors and, and insulators and semiconductors, and it's bathed in this plasma. And so there can be spacecraft charging of different parts of a huge object like the space station. Um, it's not normally a big problem, but during the largest storms is when they see the largest spacecraft charging. So that's definitely something that they look at. Cool. Um, and a question from Rob that I think you touched on, but it was um, a question that we had had on, on Solar Week as well. Um, how far south has, oh, how, oh no, this is different. How far south has Steve been seen? Yeah, that's a great question. So it has been seen, we have a um, couple years of observations. It's been seen into Wyoming, Utah. Mostly it um, likes to hang out around Calgary. And now that the solar cycle has been less active, it's actually going to higher latitudes. And we think we understand all of that because this um, underlying phenomena, the subauroral ion drift that we've known about for a long time, that matches the statistics of those events uh, that we've actually studied um, from satellites crossing them thousands of times. And so when the solar cycle is weaker, it's going to go to higher latitudes and then during larger storms, but again, we don't know which storms, uh, it can be seen um, farther south, definitely all of the northern states. And a little bit below that, it also really depends on how dark of the sky, how dark the sky is where you are. Then that, that can be a challenge. If you want to um, see more about Steve, you can um, follow the Twitter account that one of the Alberta Aurora Chasers, which is a great group of people um, that we've been working with and that is organized on their own on Facebook, um, supports and shares a bunch of observations of Steve. So social media really is a great place to learn more. Okay. Um, a question from Ed, is there a maximum and minimum altitude for, the, for seeing the aurora, for the aurora effect? Yeah, that's a really great question. So the maximum altitude is really the edge of space where the atmosphere is just dense enough to get a little bit of light. And the red that you get up at like 600 miles, 1,000 kilometers, is um, and it's from this collision, uh, the, the atom gets excited and then emits light. And it actually emits light like two minutes later. So it's a very slow emission. That's that's what determines the upper boundary. And then the lower boundary is really where the atmosphere gets thick enough that 
all the collisions just stop and you get pow, a bunch of light. Um, and that goes down to about 60 miles or 100 kilometers. Uh, maybe a little bit less if it's really energetic, it can penetrate down lower. But it's really, that's where the atmosphere gets very thick. And so all the light, boom, gets emitted. They, all the energy gets um, dissipated about that altitude. Cool. And here's an interesting question from a teacher. Um, in the absence of advanced prediction models for the solar weather events, are there observed changes in behavior of different species or animals? Uh, very interesting. So we, um, there has been some research on this. Um, people have looked into whether uh, sometimes there's like whales that get lost and might beach themselves and whether there's a correlation with large storms. And there's research on um, the effects of uh, different types of land. So there's conductivity of the rock versus conductivity of the um, ocean versus a coastline. That's like pretty cutting edge research. So we don't, um, I'm probably missing something uh, because I, I'm not as familiar with the, the animal part, um, but that's the, the biggest example I can think of. There's a couple other, there's other cutting edge research on how exactly different animals that are able to sense the magnetic field where in their body they can do it. I, I think I saw a recent paper about birds, um, but I don't remember the details about that. Hmm. Yeah, I saw something in National Geographic about the, the conductivity of the rocks, supposedly mm -hmm. in more danger in New England. Mm -hmm. um, so here's one from Ed that says, I have heard that some people have heard the, the aurora crackle. Is this possible? Yeah, that's another really great research kind of question. And it's something that people have said, people in northern communities, um, it, it's been said for a long time. It's also been investigated. Scientists have gone out with different types of uh, equipment to try and, and um, sense, try and understand, is it really, is light, uh, sorry, is sound really being produced? Um, as I think there's some new research on that as well. As far as I know, it hasn't been fully explained, um, but it is something that is great, uh, a great potential example for citizen scientists where, you know, we want to, people are out there, they may really be in a remote place where the conditions, both atmospheric and higher than that, electromagnetic, are correct that some waves or sound that's in um, the frequencies that we can hear actually gets to the ground. And so um, it's also a very interesting question. And I, I do see another question here about the aurora being seen in Lake Placid, New York, and it was white in color and why not red and green? And that is a great question. Um, and I'm also from Lake Placid, New York. My grandparents were from there as well. So um, the answer to that question, though, is about our eyes. So our eyes actually at night do not sense color as well as cameras. So we, our eyes are good for black and white at night. It has to do with the rods and the cones in our eyes. But um, if you can't sense the color, you're just going to see white, basically. Um, it's, and then a camera can actually pick up the individual is more sensitive to those different wavelengths. And then you can also have different, you always, you don't, you see a lot of photographs of aurora and you very rarely see how long is the exposure time, what are the settings. Um, but, you know, if you're seeing an aurora that's got a lot of red, it's generally quite a bit of a longer setting than something from just Alaska that's all green because it can be very strong when you're seeing it at high latitudes and you won't need a very long exposure. Wow. Okay, I think we should be uh, cognizant of people's times. 
And um, thank you so much for talking to us, Liz. It's been really, really interesting. I want to um, thank everybody for coming. Um, Dr. McDonald has also included a list of resources that you can check out. That should be in the chat. And um, please answer our short survey. Um, that link is also in the chat. That really helps us out with future um, work for Solar Week and future presentations. And head on over to solarweek.org to ask leading solar scientists your questions about the sun or life as, as a scientist. Solar Week runs through tomorrow. And then we'll see you again in October. Thank you again, Liz. Great. Thank you.